My name is Dan Wilcox and I'm the designer and builder of DWX Heat Exchangers. Uh, this is the third video in a series that I'm doing. So if you haven't watched the first two, I recommend that you do so because I'm not going to go over a lot of, uh, a lot of detail um, on the differences between these two heaters. Uh, I did that in the first two videos, so I suggest you watch those. This video is about a recent head-to-head -head test I did between a DWX heat exchanger and a coiled tubing heater that's out there and available to be purchased on the internet. I live in Wisconsin here, so I drilled a couple of holes uh, in the ice on my pond and I ran both of these heaters on the same dredge engine uh, with the same pump at the same RPM. The water temperature beneath the ice was 30 degrees and the maximum water output temperature on the DWX heater was 115 degrees at a half a gallon a minute flow rate and the maximum water temperature out of the coiled tubing heater was 83 degrees at the same half a gallon a minute flow rate. So the DWX heat exchanger had an 85 degree um, increase in water temperature over the 30 degree pond water and the coiled tubing heater ha had only a 53 degree increase over the uh, pond water temperature. So the heat exchanger was 32 degrees hotter than the coil tubing heater. And in that test the outer shell of the heat exchanger uh, remained below 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, whereas the outer shell of the coil tubing heater uh, was over 250 degrees. So this test really demonstrates the advantage of using a heat exchanger over a coiled tubing uh, to build a dredge heater. A uh, heat exchanger has far greater thermal efficiency and extracts more exhaust heat than a coiled tubing heater. Remember that those maximum output temperatures is 115 degrees on the um, heat exchanger and 83 degrees on the coil tubing heater. That's at the valve itself. <clears throat> now, once you pump that water down 20 plus feet of hot water hose down to the diver, you're going to lose 10 degrees plus or minus. Uh, so using those test numbers, a DWX heat exchanger would be putting out 105 degree water at the diver, whereas a coiled tubing heater would be 73 degree water. And that's just with 10 degree uh, line loss drop um, through your hot water hose. So this test really demonstrated that a DWX heat exchanger has much greater thermal efficiency and will produce more hot water than any single pass coiled tubing heater uh, that's out there, whether it's a homemade one or um, one like this that's commercially made. Most people know that internal combustion engines are very inefficient. Uh, they only convert about 30% of burnt fuel into work energy. Uh, the remaining 70% is converted to thermal energy and wasted. So half of the thermal energy produced by the engine is absorbed by the engine block itself and radi radiated away by the um, flywheel fan. <clears throat> and cooling fins. So really only half of the thermal energy produced by the engine 
uh, exits through the exhaust. Now, um, regardless of the design, wetsuit heaters tap into this waste exhaust heat and use it to supply hot water to the diver. So a larger GX390 engine burns more fuel and produces more exhaust heat than a smaller um, GX160 or GX200 uh, dredge engine. So uh, any wetsuit heater on a larger engine will produce more hot water at a higher flow rate than on a smaller engine. So as I mentioned, on the smaller GX160 through GX270 dredge engine, the thermal efficiency of your wetsuit heater is extremely important if you actually want usable hot water. And by usable, I mean water that is hot enough and at a flow rate great enough to actually warm up the diver. That's the whole point of having a wetsuit heater on your dredge, right? And again, the water from the heater has to travel through 20 or more feet of hose to get to the diver. So depending on the temperature of the river water, it, you can experience a 10 degree Fahrenheit or more uh, drop in hot water temperature between the heater and the diver. So going back to those test numbers, um, like I said, with the, the line loss in the hot water hose, you'd be getting 100 plus degree water um, at the diver from uh, the heat exchanger versus 70 degree, 70 degree water or below from a coiled tubing heater. So I personally, I, as a, a dredger, I wouldn't consider that to be usable hot water. I mean, that's just far too cold uh, to actually warm up the diver. So the head-to-head -head testing that I did on both of these heaters was on a Honda GX200 clone. So it was a Tillotson 212E engine. But the temperature numbers that I got from both heaters are going to be real similar to um, if you ran this on a, um, a stock GX200. For those of you that have a GX270 dredge engine, uh, you're going to get about 30% uh, more heat, more hot water um, using this on your dredge engine over the results I got out of uh, that Honda GX200 clone. Now, <clears throat> that's using a heat exchanger. If you bolt this coiled tubing heater onto your GX270, you're not going to realize that 30% increase over a GX200 because instead of like with mine, I build a custom low profile stainless uh, exhaust manifold that goes on my heat exchanger which drops the uh, center of gravity down low and this obviously threads on all the way up to there if you look in through the cutaway you see the uh, diffuser plate where uh, the exhaust is diffused up through the internal tubes. But you can see the distance that that hot exhaust has to travel when it's threaded on. It goes about an inch and it's directly into the heat exchanger where it uh, starts converting that thermal energy into heating, heating the water. And with this particular manufacturer, <coughs> he he cheats on, on his uh, coil tubing heater on the exhaust manifolds. So on this one you can see this is your standard exhaust manifold for a GX160 or 200. But when you move up to the 
um, heater for the larger engines each heats and uh, as you reuse your stock exhaust manifold and he makes an adapter plate to run that into his heater so now you have this long run here and your stock manifold you can take it off and weigh it it's uh it's a pound and a quarter of, stain of uh, cast iron so that's a lot of weight to heat up and that's a lot of distance uh, it's about four inches here uh, that your exhaust have, has to travel uh, plus the adapter so before the engine exhaust even makes it in to the the heater uh, to start converting some of that thermal energy into hot water so you're you're not going to realize a, a a large increase if any frankly um, between putting this heater on a GX200 versus a GX270 just because using this big heavy exhaust manifold um, you lose a lot of efficiency through that as a matter of fact running this heat exchanger my heat exchanger on a GX200 and running this heater on a GX270 I'll still make more hot water or hotter water than this on a 270 so let's get to the whole point of this particular video I've had more than a few people uh, reach out to me with serious buyers remorse after getting this particular heater and using it on their dredge now after getting my hands on one um, you know as a metal fabricator and welder I mean I'm just appalled with the um, the build quality of it I mean first of all this uh, the builder knows that this is going to be used in a wet environment uh, so why not build your top and bottom plates your manifold here and your thin wall um, three inch tube here why not just make it out of stainless it's it really isn't that much more um, for stainless plate and stainless tubing over the over uh, carbon steel and they also make quarter inch stainless threaded rod that you can use instead of the rusty carbon steel I mean it, it it's really only uh, to build this out of stainless as opposed to just this carbon steel uh, per unit it's maybe twenty dollars more it it really is not that much more expensive to just build it with stainless where you're not going to have this uh, you know rusting and pitting problem other than that you know the the strainer on these systems any heater that you build is like the most important safety feature okay because water from your dredge pump is going to be coming in with debris in it and the strainer strains this out or strains out that crap so it doesn't plug up your uh, valve your hot water hose or the lines on, on this one the input and output lines your, uh, of your coil now like I said in, the, in uh, my other videos these are only eighth inch a little bit over eighth inch uh, inside diameter of this coil tubing so it's pretty easy to plug up as opposed to having a one inch um, water inlet fitting so it but it it still is crucial to to supply whatever heater you build with clean water and keep the flow 
because where you end up with, with uh, dangerous situations or problems with any heater is the flow to the heater stops, the engine keeps running, and so any water that's inside the, your heater, it's not moving, and the exhaust is blowing on it, and it's superheating it to a point where it flashes the steam. Now you gotta remember, <clears throat> um, steam at, at 212 degrees, the expansion rate for water to steam is 1,700 to one. Um, you know, steam has so much energy, that's why they use it to power steam engines and steam turbines in like power plants or locomotives. I mean, it's, it has an incredible amount of energy and the last thing you want to happen is in any heater is your water flow stops, your engine keeps running, you superheat the water in your system and it flashes the steam. That's how divers get burned. So if it's so important to provide clean water uh, to your heater, then why would you chintz uh, and buy the cheapest strainer that you could, can possibly find? You know, I mean, it really is not that much more. This is like $15, this is $30. And, <laughs> You know, it really is not that much more to uh, what I think, do it right, you know. I'll show you the screen size differences in here. So this has much greater, you know, filter capacity where it's not going to plug up than this one. And the mesh size on this is way more than necessary. This is like 150 mesh. It may even be 200 mesh. Um, that's, that's way more than you need. This is 50 mesh, and that's actually more than you need. Uh, you know, a 20 mesh uh, screen, I probably have one here. Yeah, here's a, you can see the difference. This is a 20 mesh screen, and really that's all you need. Um, yeah, 50 mesh is uh, the standard one that I use, but it's just to stop debris from going into your your hot water system, but 150 or 200 mesh, I mean, this is just gonna plug up, um, unnecessarily plug up um, with all the such small debris, and you're gonna have to clean this out a lot more often. The problem with that is having the black filter cup on there, who knows when it's time to, cl to clean your filter. I mean, other than stopping uh, the dredge and opening up and then taking a look at it, um, having a clear strainer cup is just a huge advantage of just being able to look at it as it's running and determine when your strainer needs to be cleaned. I mean, with something that that's so important for safety, I, I just don't understand why you would not spend an extra fifteen dollars in uh, your build cost to uh, to put a quality strainer on there. So I guess the last thing I want to mention regarding uh, build quality on that is this. I guess what they call a uh, I, I don't know hot water holding tank. Uh, once again, this isn't stainless, and the price difference between a you know, eight, eight inch, one inch uh, nipple and caps between this galvanized is, I mean, it's a few dollars. I mean, it really is not that much more, um, but this is what he uses. Now, I measured this, you remember the, uh, the coil inside of this coil tubing heater holds two ounces of water, that's it. And this holds an additional four ounces of water so I guess they're using this as a buffer. If uh, water does flash to steam, and this is gonna be f full of water because uh, the hot water comes out of uh, the heater and goes into this uh, expansion tank or holding tank, whatever they're referring to it as, and it's gonna run into 
four ounces of, of hot water here, and that's going to be your buffer from uh, to try and drop that steam t pressure um, and temperature down. Um, that's that's just a poor way of making a a reserve tank. You know, I mean, even if you were going to um, rely on this. Um, We grab something so if you're gonna you know use this nipple here if you're gonna rely on this as some sort of quote-unquote safety uh, from the water possibly flashing to steam <clears throat> then why not just weld a bung onto it like I did in, in this adapt adapter I made for something else why not weld a bung onto this? Because that's your holding tank. And that bung you can use a, uh, put a temperature relief, 145 degree temperature relief valve in there. And so if the water inside this, um, your holding tank, this four ounces that you're using here, um, weld a half inch bung on it and put a thermal relief valve on there. Now when that steam enters in here and raises the temperature, you got a purge valve in there that's gonna open and vent that steam out. I mean, if you're gonna use something as crappy as this for a holding tank, I mean, why not, I mean, you know, spend $2, weld a bung on there and put a, you know, a $15 thermal relief valve in there, I mean, I wouldn't use that. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm appalled that that's the quality of the build that they use. You can go on Amazon and find a um, a reservoir, stainless steel reservoir tank for like twenty or thirty dollars. And here's one I found here on Amazon. It already has uh, quarter inch bungs TIG welded into it. This holds thirty ounces of water. Already has a, a mount TIG welded on it. And you, so you can put this in line. And I just stuck a, stuck a bung on there with a thermal relief valve. I didn't weld it on or drill the hole through the tank because I'm not sure on the uh, final placement how I'm going to mount this. So for the purposes of this video, I just stuck it on to show you. Now, this valve would regulate the internal water temperature of this tank. If it reaches 45, 145 degrees, this valve is going to open and it's going to vent out that hot water. And then I also put a, a second drain bung on here because, you know, if we use these in really cold weather <clears throat> and this, this tank is filled with 30 ounces of water and freezes, uh, it's going to crack and destroy it. So you really need to think ahead and weld the drain bug on. But the point of this is, you know, here's $5 in parts and here's $40 in parts to actually build something that, uh, you know, or provide something to your customers that is going to offer some level of, of actual, I hate to use the word safety, but that is going to better prevent, um, scalding if water does flash to steam now that's the big difference between the heat exchanger and the coil tubing is this outside shell works like the holding tank where this holds 20 ounces of water i mean 10 times the volume of the coil inside that heater so that and of course this tank on here just like this one, you have a thermal relief valve. So if the water temperature in here goes over 145, it opens and vents. Same thing with this. But even if you don't want to spend the extra money, cut into your profits to do that, why not just weld a bung onto your uh, little reserve tank that you have here, the proper size, it's a three quarter, you'd weld a half on there, and put a thermal relief valve on there, wouldn't that um, better help prevent water, you know, or steam 
going down a hot water hose? I, to me, it sure would. Well, I could go on for an hour regarding the, uh, the build quality of this particular heater from this manufacturer. The bottom line is, is you're looking at, and I'm being generous, you're getting $150 worth of parts and, for 750 bucks, and that's why I have so many people with buyer's remorse contacting me and asking me, hey, I, I already have, I have this thing, uh, what can I do to improve the efficiency of it? And really that's what this video is gonna be about. Now you're stuck with this, now what do you do with it? I mean, money is tight for everybody, I get it. Um, so you wanna try and um, cut your losses at least and make this a little more usable now, I don't expect that uh, everybody watching the video here is going to be able to do the, the things that I'm going to do to uh, upgrade this heater, um, but at least it'll give you some idea on, on what, you can, what you can do with yours. So the first thing is these, these oversized uh, top and bottom plates. Um, don't help with the efficiency of this. You really want to decrease the overall mass of this heater just because of the way that it's designed. So I ran this uh, stainless coil through my pressure or parts washer to get a lot of the carbon off, but it's still um, still pretty dirty. But the, like I said in the other video, there's approximately 15 feet of uh, quarter inch coiled tube with about a little over an eighth inch inside diameter. So I mean, it's pretty heavy wall um, tubing, much more than it actually needs to be. Now stainless steel uh, isn't the best for uh, thermal conductivity. So you wanna have a, as thin a wall as possible to really transfer that heat. Now you can see this coil is just straight through. There's nothing in there as a, a baffle or a restrictor to slow that, uh, uh, the exhaust that's passing through there down. When you look into the, the shell itself, it's just a straight through shell And then there's a half inch bung welded on this side with this dinky little uh, muffler. And the, the exhaust manifold itself that he has, this is just standard zinc threaded rod, so these get all rusty as well. And they have these oversized gaskets here. But you can see the on the inside, that's the top cover, you can see the rust and pitting that's happening from uh, the condensation in the uh, engine exhaust. And the bottom plate was the same way, but I actually uh, bead blasted uh, the inside of this plate, not the outside. Because I was thinking about reusing this bottom plate and then uh, I decided against it. <clears throat> so the guy that makes these uh, uses a three-quarter inch uh, pipe nipple here. So he ends up with, uh, it's about five-eighths inside diameter. And then this is uh, just over an eighth, maybe three sixteenth um, exhaust flange. And it looks like he's got a a plasma table <clears throat> from the marks on here. 
And, you know, one thing I can mention is that, uh, I don't know about yours, but uh, my plasma table cuts stainless just as well as it does carbon steel. So, um, why not just use stainless, I guess is the question. <clears throat> so, after I ran uh, that last head-to-head -head test using the stock configuration on this heater, I pulled my spark plug and there's a lot of restriction in that heater to a point where my engine just really wasn't running properly. You could hear it. Um, so because of all that exhaust restriction, uh, my engine was running rich. So if you buy one of these coiled tubing heaters from this particular guy, um, you better buy a jet kit because you're going to have to change your, uh, reduce your high speed and low seat speed carburetor jet in your, your engine. It's really restrictive. Um, so anyway, back to how you can make this heater that you have more efficient. So there isn't any reason that this heater needs to come apart. Um, as much as it does, other than to clean the uh, carbon out of your coil, but it doesn't need to come apart um, completely like that to do it. So there isn't any reason you can't weld this bottom plate uh, onto uh, the bottom so you can then you can access your coil for cleaning in the top. So what I did, So I made my own bottom plate, and I made it to fit um, inside the tubing, inside the stock tube. And then I'll TIG weld that on there. But you can see from the manifold that I made, the inside, first of all, it's obviously all stainless. And why wouldn't you use stainless, frankly? But you can see there's a full quarter inch um, exhaust flange. And so the the opening, this is a this is five ace and this is seven ace opening. So you're gonna get much less exhaust restriction coming through this exhaust, um, which should take care of a lot of the uh, the carbon problem uh, inside this heater. So there's the, the manifold, and I actually have it where it threads up in, so I welded a bung onto here. This is actually what you're looking at going up inside that. So you can see the, this is a GX160 to a GX200 um, exhaust manifold that I use. That threads up into the the bung I welded on this bottom plate and then you can see how short this is just like a one inch extension that goes up into the bottom of this coil here and it sits about like that so there's nothing to really stop any blow by anything that blows back down because you got to remember and mufflers right there. So if you don't stop the exhaust, you want to direct it up that coil obviously, um, but if you don't make this long enough or put a restrictor on it, some of that is just going to bleed right out and it's so your hot exhaust isn't even going to hit the coils. So I made that extension obviously a lot more open, but that extension's a little longer and then I put a restrictor plate on the bottom so when this does go up inside the coil here you'll see that I drop these in that groove there we go you can see how that restrictor plate there prevents exhaust from backing down and just coming right out 
that exhaust that's or uh, your muffler that's sitting right there. So that's just one improvement, um, and you could do it on on this one. You could just TIG weld on a or MIG weld for that matter a little restrictor that's going to fit up inside the, the coil. So I eliminated the um, this bottom plate and then this top plate here is really oversized too. It doesn't need to be that big. What I did was uh, I welded a, a, uh, just a lip in here and then cut out a flange or a, a cover so your bottom plate is going to get welded in here and this is where your coil ins and outs are going to come out and then you're going to have a removable cover now the reason I did this is I really wanted to clean up this outside uh, for the purposes of putting in insulation on here. So let me stop this and I'll put the screws in. So this is the uh, top cover. So I welded that lip on the inside for this uh, stainless cover to sit on. And of course, use a, some stainless button head bolts here. To run in through the top and hold this cover down. So, I mean, not only does it look a lot nicer than, uh, than this, I mean, it's, a, it's also more functional because now I've eliminated this, the need for these, this rusty threaded rod that, and cover that go down the side here. Okay, so that cleans up this the sides, gets that out of the way. Like I said, this will get TIG welded in. Not only does that look a lot better, if I do say so myself, it's much more functional. It's a lot less restrictive. Uh, for the exhaust and what that does is it opens it up for me to be able to insulate this outside shell because if you remember from uh, the numbers I gave you from the test this because the, the exhaust just blows right into here this outside shell heats up uh, to exhaust temperature gets really really hot and then that heat is radiated away and is lost so um, this should be insulated right from the manufacturer. I mean, to just send this bear, uh, again, like I said, he's not concerned about efficiency, um, building it the way he does. All right, let me get some of this crap out of the way here. I'll show you the real reason I got rid of the top and bottom plates is uh, to give me a nice open spot here that I can uh, properly insulate this outside shell because stopping the heat radiating off this shell if you can uh, insulate this and force that heat to stay inside here it's going to make this heater a lot more efficient so um, you certainly can uh, get your header wrap get it wet and you can just 
start wrapping and wrapping and put you know four layers on there but there's a company called design engineering incorporated um, and they make all kinds of you know header wrap and turbo wraps and soundproofing uh, heat shields you look them up online well they make a a product it's called uh, Forma Shield, and it's rated at uh, 1500 degrees and so it's it's this thick insulation here and then it has an outside aluminum textured shell to it and now with those rods out of the way obviously this one this is a leftover piece um, it hasn't been cut the size that's going to make a wonderful uh, heat wrap and heat shield for this uh, this heater and that's really going to hold a lot of check out how thick that is and this is rated at 1500 degrees so I mean um, this isn't getting over you're not going to get anywhere near that um, with the exhaust heat maybe 450 would be the max on it here's the number if you guys are interested in that so it's design engineering form a shield and it comes uh, 12 inches wide by 21 inches long it's just I've used this on, on a, ton of, a ton of builds and it's just just wonderful uh, for heat shields and it's cheap so like I said this is a leftover piece the piece you'll get is 12 by 21 look at the size of that and it's uh, Summit Racing has it it's $23 and I could wrap probably three uh, three of these heaters for at least two but probably three with uh, uh, one sheet of this so it's 23 bucks which begs the question uh, why isn't the manufacturer doing that really for so if you could wrap three of your heaters with this so that's an extra ten dollars in manufacturing costs to do that that's that's too much to make to really improve the efficiency and safety I mean you come up and touch this you're gonna burn your hand it, you know you come up and touch this wrapped you're not going to burn yourself well why wouldn't you do it I don't know. it's another one of those questions I have okay so that pretty much uh, takes care of the body of the uh, the heater itself the outside shell the changes I'm going to make to that I'm going to see how uh, restrictive it still is and I may end up cutting off this half inch bung and welding on a three-quarter bung now let me grab that and welding on a, a three-quarter bung um, as opposed to this half and instead of using this really restrictive half-inch muffler um, I would just use like a, a cheap three-quarter uh, hot dog muffler I don't think it would look as pretty having that sticking way out of the side as opposed to running this little one so one thing I did was you can take an, an eighth inch drill to open up this muffler the restriction on it and you take your drill and you can drill down in because there's there's a restrictor plate right on the inside of this so the exhaust goes in hits that restrictor plate so you can open up that restrictor in there a little bit it'll be a little little noisier but what you want is you want to improve the flow through this muffler so you can drill out go around in the pattern and drill out all these inside holes just drill them straight through that restrictor plate that's on the inside also take your die grinder and clean up the this edge here to open up open it up so I'm going to try it with this just by opening up this muffler a bit um, 
to see if that improves it where I don't have to rejet my carburetor to run this. That might be all the difference that it that it needs. The only other change I'm going to make to the uh, the outside shell is I'm going to going to weld a uh, a tab on this outside, and then I'm going to run a proper um, stainless support arm that's going to go down and, and bolt to the actual mounting lug on all the side covers. All the GX 160s, 200s, and clones of those have this mounting tab on their um, side covers, and that's what it's used for. So it's a perfect uh, size of that, that lug there. And that's where my heat exchanger uh, support arm bolts to. <clears throat> and I use a, a three quarter inch stainless arm, uh, three quarter inch wide by a quarter inch thick. So, I mean, it is a very robust um, arm that you're not going to bend. So, I'll weld a tab onto the outside shell of the heat exchanger. and the arm will bolt bolt through that it'll go down and actually bolt where it should to the mounting tab on the engine block itself instead of running some support arm like this that bolts to your plastic uh, um, air cleaner cover which really does nothing to uh, for vibration or or support for that matter it's it's plastic it's just as a your air cleaner cover just as a um, metal threaded rod coming out of the top of the cover but if you look where it goes down in just goes down into plastic I mean it's not meant to support anything this lug on your side cover that they they put on there it's not used uh, to bolt your pump on and it's there as an, you know, uh, to, um, for a mounting tab. So why not use that? So that's pretty much the modifications I'm making to the, uh, the outside shell. Other than obviously insulating it once I get it all welded up and put together. But the coil itself, um, there's zero restriction. That's it's just under two inches. It's about inch and three quarter um, opening here that goes up through that coil. So there's no restriction on the exhaust. It just rushes straight through. And so, you know, I have some experience working with um, plate heat exchangers. <clears throat> and so what you find on plate heat exchangers is uh, internal baffles that not so much slow down or restrict the exhaust, but it, it gives the exhaust, um, instead of having a straight through shot blowing straight through, it gives it an angled path which does slow down the the exhaust the velocity without restricting it too much and it it's better able to transfer heat um, to the plates and to the coils so what can you do with this stock coil that they have here so what I use is I got some half inch by two inch fender washers. Now these are 818 stainless. And uh, what the 818 stands for is, there's a stock one. It's 16th of an inch, uh, half inch uh, by two inches on the outside. 
So 818 is 18% chromium, 8% nickel. So it, it's basically 304 stainless. Uh, so that would be rated good for exhaust. Uh, and they're thick enough that you're not going to have any warping or twisting on them. So um, two inch by half inch by quarter or uh, 16th stainless fender, fender washers. And I bored them out, four of them out to uh, three quarters of an inch. And I'm going to use these as restrictors or baffles to insert inside that coil. And I'm going to put one in to show you here. So this coil itself has a lot of spring tension to it. It's very tightly wound. Um, and it holds its shape well. So I jam a small screwdriver in between the coils and that allows me the ability to get that two inch washer and lock it in. And now I just put a baffle or a restrictor inside the coil. And with the spring tension of, of this stainless, it's not going anywhere. I mean, they're extremely difficult to shove in between the coils. You can see it sitting in there. And all I'm going to do is put uh, four of them in this coil. There's one in the top. Remember, I do have that restrictor that's coming in in the bottom. So I want to come up a bit, then I'm going to put a total of four of these baffles in here going up through the coil so there will be I wouldn't call them restrictors because these are three quarter inch uh, I bored them out to three quarter um, so they shouldn't have too much exhaust uh, restriction but they will baffle the, the exhaust going through enough so these washers themselves are going to heat up and they're going to transmit that heat uh, to the coil because they're trapped and making contact with the edge of the coil. So instead of just the exhaust heat blowing on this outside and on the inside, um, now we're actually dumping some heat in between the coils as well. <clears throat> so that's going to better transfer the exhaust heat to the water that's flowing through the coil here. <clears throat> so how it's going to look inside the, the shell itself. Is the new bottom plate that will be welded in. And there's going to be four uh, baffles that are going to be inside the coil and the exhaust will go up to the top the new lid that I have on there that's closed off once it hits the top it's going to cycle back down the outside of the coil heating it up and then ultimately get pushed out through the muffler So putting those baffles inside, these restrictors inside the coil, um, and then really insulating not just the, this outside shell, but I'm going to cut a piece for um, the top and maybe even the bottom. I may uh, cut an insulation piece to, to go in there. Oh, and one thing I wanted to to say when using this uh, this DEI mat uh, form a gasket um, hold on 3M actually makes um, some high temperature foil tape so when you wrap this around and and you're going to cut it to to length you're going to there's going to be a seam here if you want to make it look nice like I always have to. Um, 
get some of this 3M foil tape. It's it's rated to 600 degrees, and this outside temperature is going to be nowhere near 600 degrees. But the adhesive in there is rated for that, and so that'll just be a real nice, clean way of you know finishing this off. Where when you have it running on your dredge, it's going to look it's going to look impressive. And then, like I said, I'm going to cut out a <clears throat> uh, a circle for the top and put that on. So this entire shell will be wrapped with this uh, DEI Forma Shield and also the top. And we'll see if uh, I fit a piece in there for the bottom. And then. Uh, with those modifications, I'm going to go back out on the ice, uh, drill another hole, set up the same test rig because we already have the baseline numbers for uh, the stock configuration on this heater. And we'll see with uh, changing the manifold, um, putting some restrictors or some baffles inside the coil and running some really decent insulation uh, how much we can improve the efficiency of uh, of this heater so some of you guys with your buyer's remorse of uh, of buying one of these um, maybe we can actually make it uh, a lot more functional um, than what you have we'll see the next video i'll make um, is going to be Run out on the ice and running a test on on these modifications to see how well they work Thanks a lot for watching